All right, thanks. Um, so yeah, the title of my talk is Demonstrating the Success of Habitat Restoration for Young Forest Specialists. So um, a number of species that rely on young forest habitats are in decline because these uh, habitats themselves have declined a lot um, over the last three decades um, throughout the Northeast. So this includes at least 65 vertebrates, um, a few of them are depicted here. Um, and these are all species of greatest conservation need within the Northeast. Uh, it also includes New England's only native rabbit, which is the New England cottontail. And this, this species is of conservation need throughout the Northeast, but it's endangered in the states of New Hampshire and Maine. Um, so New England cottontails are very, um, very specific habitat specialists. They're uh, very reliant on forests that are young and in the early successional stages, um, or thickets, they're commonly called, or shrublands. Um, and they utilize that very dense uh, vegetation that's in a thicket, or they require this very dense understory that might be underneath a higher canopy. Um, so this is an example of that type of habitat. You can see it's really thick, really dense, um, and there are an, they, uh, the species, New England cottontail, recovers, uh, requires excuse me, a number of uh, plant species that provide that very thick cover, um, such as rose or viburnum or young alders and beet birch trees, um, but they also require species that, that give them the food that they need, and some of that is found along the edges of uh, more grassy areas, for example. And so over the past decade, there's been a really enormous conservation effort um, that has focused on creating and um, restoring these uh, early successional habitats throughout the Northeast. And a great deal of money has been spent towards this effort and a great deal of acreage has been modified on the landscape. And much of this has been in the name of restoration for the New England cottontail. And so this has been like a really amazing success story from that perspective. Um, and so, um, the, however, documenting the success of that is sort of the next phase that, that um, people are, are, are looking for um, ways to do that. And so counting and explaining the number of acres that have been restored is certainly a first great step towards that, and that's being done. Um, but really, a question that I'm interested in is how are the species responding to all these efforts? And so that's what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to talk about two different studies that I've been working on um, that are involving monitoring the specific species that might be responding to this habitat. So the first is looking at the cottontail itself. How is it responding to the efforts on its behalf? And then secondly, um, I've been, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some work where I've been looking at how some of the shrublum dependent birds are responding to the management efforts on the New England cottontail sites um, that they're also utilizing. And so the purpose of both of these studies are to provide feedback on the effectiveness of those young forest uh, restoration efforts. Okay, so first uh, I want to talk about assessing the response of the cottontails to restoration. So this is ongoing work and it's happening in three states, primarily in New Hampshire, but also in Maine and Connecticut. And um, so to determine how the rabbits are responding, we need a measure. And so our measure is the number of rabbits um, on a habitat site. And so using that as a metric requires some estimate of the population size. Uh, it turns out that's not really super easy to do for the cottontails because they're a really cryptic species and they're living in this very dense habitat. So you're not really going to readily observe them. And so what we do is we use their sign, and specifically we use their fecal pellets, um, and we do uh, surveys to find their fecal pellets in the wintertime. And so in the wintertime, the pellets are really quite visible on the, on the fresh snow. And also, more, more useful for us, is that we can use these fecal pellets um, to learn things about the rabbits themselves because we can extract DNA from them. And from the DNA that we get from the fecal pellets, we can identify individual rabbits by their unique genetic signatures. And so in doing so, then, we can determine what, what individuals are on a specific patch, and then we can use that in population estimates. And so to do that, 
Uh, first of all, we need to uh, survey a patch very intensively, um, as showed by, for example, this loose weaving transect that's going um, throughout this, this patch. And we need to collect uh, pellets throughout the patch uh, as intensively as we can so that we want to make sure that we've uh, rep representatively, representatively sampled as many individuals um, that are inhabiting that patch. And then if we do that, if we've done a really good uh, intensive sampling effort, we can use the information we collect about unique rabbit individuals in a genetic, in a mark recapture estimate. Um, and so this becomes a genetic mark recapture estimate because every time we sample a unique genotype, it's like we're catching a rabbit. Um, and when we resample the same genotype, it's like we've recaptured that rabbit, okay? All right, and so, then um, what I'm showing you here uh, in, is one outcome of this where we, uh, the different colors show indivi different individual rabbits. Uh, the triangles are males, so there are four unique males that were identified in this survey, and the circles are three unique females that were identified. Um, and so the more, the more samples you get, um, the, as you increase the samples, you will diminish the number of unique genotypes, and then mathematically um, you can uh, calculate, get, get an estimate of the population size from that. All right, so that's our methodology. Um, and here's one example of how we've applied this method. Um, and so we've done this in, in a site in the Cape Elizabeth landscape. So this is in Southern Maine. This is just south of Portland um, near Scarborough. And um, we, and so here's, here's the landscape with a number of patches identified with different colors um, that are differentially suitable to, to cottontails. The ones that are purple are currently occupied. Okay, and so we did an estimate in this patch. This is our patch of interest here. It's Libby Field. It's a site that's been intensively managed by the Fish and Wildlife Service over the last uh, several years. And prior to the management, the habitat was pretty marginal and it didn't support any cottontails. Um, but a couple years ago, we did a survey and we did an abundant estimate and we found about an estimate of 20 rabbits um, on this 12 he hectare area. And so that gave us a density of 1.7 rabbits per hectare, which is a reasonable number of rabbits. It's on the low end, but it's sort of within the range of densities that you typically see um, in, the, in the Northeast. And so what this did is it, it demonstrated that, okay, here's an area that now is supporting rabbits and is currently in the state of habitat that we have there is, is currently suitable for supporting rabbits. Another example of where we've used this is to track, um, track the patterns that occur after the rabbits have been reintroduced into locations. And so there is currently a captive breeding program for New England cottontails. Um, this happens in the zoos. They're, they're breeding them in um, Roger Williams Park in Rhode Island and in the Queen Zoo in New York. And some rabbits that are bred are then released onto the landscape. That's the ultimate goal. And one of the first places where we've had a successful release is actually um, here in New Hampshire in the Durham area in the Bellamy River Wildlife Management um, area. And so we can use our genetic technique then, and we have been using it to track how the rabbits, how the rabbit population does post-release. And so here's just a little bit of data from the Bellamy uh, management release. And so founder rabbits were released in 2013 and 14, and, and also subsequently, but this is our initial two releases in this yellow area. The orange dots show where fecal pellets were found in later years. And so what we see that here is by 2016, we have pellets that are found down here, um, which is about a kilometer or so from the release site. So we've seen dispersal from the release site, so we're documenting population growth. Um, however, if you look over here, you see that we actually are documenting a lot of population fluctuation up and down over the years, and then by 2017, we actually hit a pretty low point of just a few individuals, which then was information that was used to justify continuing to put more rabbits out there, and we're really still in the learning phase of understanding how many rabbits we really need to keep supplementing a landscape because here, this is essentially an isolated population. There's no rabbits near enough by to disperse into it. So we were trying to get this as a self-sustaining population and we're still in the learning phase of that. But this is a method that helps us monitor how to go about it. 
Okay, so then um, the second part that I wanted to speak about is now that uh, rather not only just looking at the cottontail's response, uh, we're also interested if we're putting all this effort into this habitat, how are other species responding? And in particular, we've been looking at the birds. And so we wanted to assess the role of the New England cottontail um, as a representative species for shrubland birds. And so what we mean by representative species is if we're doing management for the cottontail, can that actually serve as a surrogate for other species? And so the habitats that we've created, are they then functionally uh, working for these other species and how so spe more specifically? So that's what we were looking at here. And so to understand this, we did some bird surveys. Um, we did them at 66 different locations across 28 sites in southern uh, Maine, New Hampshire, and then in Massachusetts off Cape Cod. And um, so at the sites we do uh, an avian or a, bir a bird point count survey, we call it, where we're um, making observations visually and listening for songs for all the birds that are in this 50 meter radius of, of the observer. Uh, we also take vegetation data so, so that we can link the habitat characteristics to the bird occurrence patterns. So what we found from um, this effort, we detected uh, 22 shrubland bird specialists across all of our sites, and all of our sites were sites that are managed specifically for New England cottontails. Um, so this included a number of common species, um, like catbirds and song sparrows, goldfinches and cardinals that use this habitat, but it also included a number of much rarer species um, like field sparrows and brown thrashers and indigo buntings um, and prairie warblers. Um, so, oh, and our blue winged warbler, which is a quite conservation concern. And so um, these were all detected on our various sites. And then we used our data for five species where we had enough data across our sites to look at habitat variables that are influencing their occurrence. And so all these five species have some slightly different and fine scale habitat preferences. Um, some of them, like the black and white warbler, actually prefers um, a little bit later successional stages than, than those that are optimal for the cottontail. Um, and that came through in our analyses. Similarly, the chestnut sided warbler. Eastern towhee is also fairly specific and had some preferences more for very low vegetation. Um, they, they spend a lot of time in the ground. Um, the prairie warbler and the yellow warbler had habitat preferences that were very in line with the New England cottontail. And so our, our habitat variables that we found that were actually very important in predicting where you'd find yellow warblers and prairie warblers were high stem density counts and the, uh, high uh, vegetation density at a height of two to three meters, okay? Um, and those are, those are variables that are very conducive to, to cottontails. Those, that, that describes really nice, thick uh, cottontail habitat as well. Okay, and then we looked more broadly across all the species that we did detected and we did an indicator species analysis. And here we were trying to ask if there are um, these characteristics that characterize cottontail habitat, which, which are up here, um, do, do these characteristics, um, how do these characteristics explain the occurrence of these other, these 22 birds? And there are, are there, how do these other 22 birds fit in with these characteristics? Do, the, do any of them indicate the birds? And what we actually found was that 10 species um, of shrubland birds uh, had char habitat characteristics that, that um, determine their occupancy that were, ver that were also suitable for, that also were consistent with the type of habitat that arose from New England cottontail management. So basically what that means is if that we're managing for cottontails, we're probably also gonna benefit these 10 species. Um, and eight of these species are uh, of conservation need as well. And so by managing for one species of need, we're also bringing along um, several others um, in, in other, other taxa. So um, that, that seems like a, a useful thing to know. Okay, so 
Um, in conclusion, um, restoration efforts that are benefiting the cottontails are also working for other uh, young forest specialists. And um, I think it's important to, to actually demonstrate that success and to use that information. Um, I mean, we could certainly have predicted that, okay, some shrub and birds are going to come along, but there's finer scale information in there. And what we can really get use that for is to really understand exactly what our management endpoints are doing and what our habitat endpoints are doing with respect to the very specific bird species and what kind of management will uh, specifically affect and benefit which suite of species. So thank you. So how do you create the habitat? Do you put in clear forest? Oh, a lot of it is clear cutting. Um, there's many different methods. Um, so there's clear cutting, um, there's herbicide treatments, um, and then there's places where they're going in and planting into old fields. So there's a combination of methods for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Anita. Historically, um, so the last century is when our forest all grew back. Um, was the cottontail density much higher during the so-called colonial period? Yeah, that's a great question that people always wonder about. So what's the baseline? Um, and we don't have a great answer. We know that the, um, there was always a mosaic of habitats on the landscape. And we know that our landscape today is very different from that. And it doesn't have the same, same mosaic. We know that um, natural disturbances are very different and less frequent than they used to be. And so we don't have as many of the uh, pockets of <laughs> different stages, different successional stages of forest as, we, as would have occurred in the past. And so no, cottontails were never continuously uh, distributed. They were always an early su successional stage species, um, and they probably often had, they probably had consistently fluctuating populations. But what we know that today, our cottontail populations have really tanked. I mean, they're very, very low. And uh, there isn't, most of the areas that I've looked at, um, now we have new data even from New York, showing that pretty much all areas have um, effective population sizes that are critically low that we don't think can sustain into the future. So, big difference. Yeah, Russ. So from the fecal collections, you can tell if it's a New England cottontail, right? And you can tell exactly who, what right, the individual. So, but there's other rabbits there, could be other rabbits there too, right? Or are they always all New England? Um, it depends where you are in their range. So there could be snowshoe hares here. And in most of Maine and New Hampshire, there shouldn't be eastern cottontails, not where the New Englands are found. Oh, okay. But in southern New England, there are also eastern cottontails, and they can be in the same patch. Well, if I see a rabbit outside my house, it's a, it's a New England No, I mean, it depends. No, no. There, it's probably an eastern cottontail. Right, okay. But on the few patches that still have New England cottontails in Maine and New Hampshire, there are no eastern cottontails. Like well, no, they just, New Easterns are coming up. They're moving up. And okay. so far, where the, only in northern New England is it true that there's no Easterns on the same patches. Okay. Um, but we do have Easterns around. So like Newington is just all Eastern cottontails. And yeah, so they're coming up. 